All right, good morning everyone and welcome to Legal Aid Queensland's webinar on dealing with the post-COVID cliff. Uh, my name is Paul Holmes and I'm a principal lawyer in the Civil Justice Services area of Legal Aid Queensland and I'm presenting today with my colleague Loretta Craig and I'm also one of the principal lawyers in Civil Justice Services team. So just a usual housekeeping um, rules apply. Uh, if, the go to, if you're trouble, having trouble accessing the webinar, um, please contact the technical help phone number at the bottom of that slide. The webinar will be recorded and put on our YouTube channel. Can I just get an indication in the question box? Can everybody hear us? Excellent, thank you very much. All right. We also have put handouts um, in the drop down menu for those of you who like to go with your handouts. Uh, there is also, um, there will be an option for Q&A. We have already been provided with some questions early um, and we will be dealing with them during the course of the webinar. If you have any questions at all as we're going through the webinar, please just drop us a line in the question box. Um, and then we're happy to answer those questions that come along. Uh, for those more experienced, say, financial counsellors that might be logging in, happy to answer the, the more complicated quest questions you have as part of the questions, but be aware that a lot of this uh, presentation is designed to give those who might not have as much experience with these debt and employment issues as you, a basic outline of the sorts of things that they should expect in the next few weeks and months. So I stress that, like Paul said, this is about a basic outline about what's happening. So if you're a very experienced financial counsellor or lawyer, I wouldn't, ex I would expect you to, to, to know a lot of this. Yes. Uh, but like I say, happy for those questions to come up. Mm. As usual, um, we're all going to do our usual polls just to get an idea of who's listening in. So the first one is around where you're from, so I'll just launch that in the poll now. And please respond as you feel the need. Um, and it was also remiss of me not to acknowledge while we're doing the poll, not to acknowledge the traditional owners and First Nations people of the land on which we're presenting you to you from um, and acknowledge um, all of their elders past, present, emerging. Uh, so my apologies for not doing that. And usually we have a slide at the We start. usually we have what a slide happened? at the start. Slide that techni technically I've, I've mucked up already, clearly. <laughs> um, so I'll just close that poll now, but that was very remiss of me. So my apologies to all for, for that. All right. Second slide, second poll we've got, um, which I'm just. Uh, I was just going to go back. There's 43% outside of Queensland. Queensland. So, again, I want to stress that this um, webinar is, whilst there is a combination of um, Commonwealth and state laws, our focus will be on how it affects consumers within Queensland. But there but will we be would, parallels. And we'll point out particularly where we think the state law applies so that you can just switch up for that. All right, so we're, we're dealing with a lot of people that are regularly dealing with clients who've gone into debt trouble. So uh, I think that's probably where we're expecting that. Yes. So I'll just close that one off now so that um, we can dive in to the meat of the presentation today. So what are we going to talk about, Loretta? Right? Well, this is what we're going to talk about, I hope. <laughs> Just a good reminder for us in case we forget. They had, for, those, for those of you in other states, we've, we've been told Brisbane's about to enter into a three-day lockdown, so it's been a busy morning. <laughs> a bit stressful, that's for sure. So, um, like it says on the slides, these are the sort of things that we'll cover today. Financial hardship, what it meant both um, during uh, the lockdown or during COVID, the COVID response, and now post-COVID, though it doesn't feel like that this morning, that's for sure. Um, the bank's response to COVID-19, what that meant for credit reporting, and credit reporting is quite interesting, and we might talk a little bit about the changes that have come through on the law and what that will mean going forward, 
and I think it will have a huge impact on how lenders will treat um, these sorts of things in the future, sure. these disasters, because of the impact that it will have on your credit reports, which wasn't reflected probably this time. Particularly in light of flooding that's happened in New South Wales and mm. to a lesser extent in Queensland. That's right, yeah. So we've got disasters everywhere. The one thing that I wanted to focus on is though that largely during COVID, the law didn't change. Yeah. It stayed the same. Just that the practices around that, um, the law changed. So let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. In Queensland, in the courts, it's not that you couldn't, it's not that you couldn't apply for enforcement warrants or that the enforcement warrants no longer existed. It's just that the courts wouldn't allow it to, those enforcement warrants to be issued until the end of September last year. So there was a period of time they just wouldn't issue that. And the courts in most states had similar types of practices in a lot of, in mm. a lot of instances. So that was a very common approach. Yes. Time. So there will be examples in everybody else's states too. And then, of course, bankruptcy changes, which are um, Commonwealth. Uh, Commonwealth. But they, again, were temporary changes. And yep. again, it was largely around practice rather than around the law. Rather than although about the, the meat of the law. Although the bankruptcy threshold change was That's very right. important. And well. it's been permanent. permanent. Made permanent. And although for a lesser amount. amount. That's right. But we'll and um, the effect of JobKeeper and JobSeeker changes, um, particularly in relation to hardship and what it will mean now that um, JobSeeker has gone back down yep. to a lower level and the end of JobKeeper. Job All right. So that's a good place to start. So financial hardship assistance is a good place to start. And I, I guess, at least from my perspective, a lot of the regulated lenders did a really good job during, during COVID mm. helping their customers out. Would that be fair? I, I think it was, we really noticed it in our practice um, that, uh, that there were far fewer people coming to us during that period of time, because at least some lenders got it right, or really tried to assist consumers through that through that difficult time. time. What we'll talk about in a minute is what's happening now. Mm, yes, but this the financial assistance and the overview of that really is that it really depends. Financial hardship assistance can be provided in any industry Absolutely. and for any goods and services. But whether there's a legal requirement to do that will depend on which category you fit and, into. And a legal requirement to consider offering, consider yeah. properly consider your request. Yes. It doesn't necessarily even mean that they have to give it, give to, it you. to you, but that they need to at least consider it. Um, and the other thing in relation to these um, these categories that we've put here that cover a lot of the, the problems that our consumers are likely to face, it will be a mixture of state and federal, federal law, yep. laws as well. So it will really depend, and again, we'll go through that. And, and I, guess, I guess the thing I'd say too in that space is the major lenders doing such a good job in a lot of cases has created almost unrealistic expectations. Absolutely, and uh, we will go into that a bit more. So, okay. And the other thing we'll, we'll, I'll just flag with you is around body corporates and council rates. They are a different beast to lenders. Yes, and we'll talk just a little bit more about that. So, in financial hardship assistance and regulated lending, I think the first thing that I want to talk about really is what well, one there's no requirement to freeze interest. Yeah. And this, then, and this applies going forward, I think it's really important, isn't mm, it? Absolutely. So if you're looking for financial hardship assistance and you think you're going to have a right to freeze interest, think again. And we're also, when I talk a little bit later about the issues around COVID, because there was a bit of pressure on the banks to actually not charge interest. Yeah. Um, for the period of time, but there are issues around that. And I mean, they don't have to in any in any event, but there are also capital issues 
around freezing or not charging interest, which made it more difficult, even if banks had have wanted to do that. But I guess I guess the important point for me though about the freezing, not freezing interest or freezing interest, is to me that impacts on what a reasonable hardship proposal actually mm. is. Because I would question if you're getting charged, I'll just pack a figure out of there, a hundred dollars a month in interest, mm. let's just say for argument's sake. And your client is only able to offer twenty dollars a fortnight. Mm. I'm seriously questioning whether that's a sensible thing to be doing. Because that that really is always the thing that clients come to. They tell me the great story about how they're in hardship. Yeah. And I always have to say is that asking for financial hardship assistance requires two links. And what Paul's really talking about is that they can't get the second link. Yeah. Everybody but to show that you're in hardship is a very low bar. Yep. So I could say, well, I was sick for two weeks. That is enough yep. to show that I'm possibly in hardship as a result of that. But the second limb that you have to be able to show, and this is where, this is where we have to do most of our education with consumers and possibly what you would have to do with consumers as well, is that they have to be able to demonstrate that if they're given the hardship, they will meet their obligations under the contract in full. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't um, capitalise interest at the end, but it's like Paul said, there's no point if all they can demonstrate on an ongoing basis is that they can pay $40 a fortnight a, a, a month, let's just say and the interest is 100, you can see that they're not going to, their debt's going to be ever increasing. That's not a hardship arrangement. And I, and I reckon, Loretta, these are the ones we're starting to see, and I'm sure out there, financial counselors and community workers are starting to see, where the major banks are saying, no, we're not giving you further hardship. Because, because you can't <laughs> demonstrate that second lien. Now that second limb, and we've always talked about this because that second limb can be met in a variety of ways. Yep. So one of the things is that, one of the things that we really pushed for as consumer advocates over many years was that that could include selling the asset. Yep. And you might say, well, what's the point if they're going to lose their house anyway, or their car? And the answer is the E word, isn't it, Florida? Equity. Equity, yes. Well, why is that important? Well, because interest, if you're not in based, even meeting the interest payments, mm. interest starts accruing on the interest yeah. very quickly. And when you add that to not meeting the full repayments that are due, mm. what starts to happen is the equity that somebody might have built up in their property. And when I say equity, the difference between, that's the difference between what the property is worth and what the property would sell for, so what you would walk away yeah. with if you sell a house. If you don't make payments, say, for six, or reduce payments like that for six, mm -hmm. nine, 12 months, potentially thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars of that equity gets eaten away. Yes. At, at, a, at an ever increasing rate. Exactly. But also, I, the, the point that I think I was trying to make, yep. but that's a very valid point and a good point to make, is that by selling the asset yourself, you often can get a better price. Absolutely. Than yes. what the lender would get. And also, you're not paying all the costs of them having someone do that. So if their house is repossessed and the lender is the one that has to go off and talk to the real estate agent. Usually they get their lawyers to do that and those costs are added on and they can quickly add up. The other thing too is that people often come to us and say, well, the bank didn't sell for a for really good price. price. Yeah. And I'm in the difficult position of having to say to them, well, unless there's quite a big discrepancy, mm -hmm it's going to be very difficult to argue that they didn't get what was yep. the market the value. value of the property. Well, because often it's the market value of a, of a house being sold by bail of auction. Yes, or, well, it, it, exactly, well, it could be. Potentially. It very well could be, yes. 
But generally speaking, I always make the point if it's if it's um, between 80 to 100% of what the value, of what you thought the market value was. That's probably about right. Then you're not going to have an argument. And 20%, well, you think, oh, well, 20% seems all right. But if the property is 600,000, 20% means that I th There's I a might range of about 480 to 600. 600. That would be okay, probably, unless you had really good evidence. And the other reality is most of our clients are never going to be able to afford to pay for a formal valuation. No. To, to test that in any event. No. And exactly. So that's, but you, that's why you might want to, as part of meeting your contractual obligations, say, give me time to sell, gives you control. It can mean that you end up with more money. Um, it also gives you time to move out, out. and find somewhere else. Yeah. But some of the um, banks may assist sometimes. Particularly if, you, if you're if you able to show you're serious. Mm. So one of the things that we often say is if you're going to make a hardship arrangement in that particular way, you might ask the lender if they would consider um, providing some money um, to help you move out, particularly if you've got no money to do that. Now, some lenders will and some, uh, won't. And some won't. Some will add it to the cost, cost of, of the, um, loan. the loan and some will... Um, and some won't. Some won't. But I guess what we're saying is what we're going to see post-COVID is people in significant financial distress mm. who the banks believe don't have a way. No. And I think it's been probably, this is one of the downsides of the bank's response, and we'll talk about the bank's response, is that some of those people may, should have gone out prior to or or during COVID. And they've lost the equity really? in the property as the interest has continued to accumulate. But there's also, look, there's also unregulated lending. Yeah. And unregulated lending, what do they have? Hard to? No. Well, they have no legal rights to hard you not. Exactly. It doesn't stop you asking. Mm. But I find the answer is usually no, go away. Mm. And um, unless <laughs> there's two things that I think may make a difference. Yep. And they are? Where I always go looking for a code of practice. Right? Mm. Well, that's that, that sounds like a really <laughs> sensible, thing. sensible thing. So sometimes these lenders do are uh, um, subject to a code of practice and particularly if they're a member of the Australian Financial Complaints Authority then often it's not only about a code of practice but it's what's good practice may provide um, some protection and some help for those consumers who are unregulated. Have we and, got questions? And there's a, good, there's a good question come through the letter around the idea of how banks go about issuing default notices and mm. repossessing the house and the bank selling it. Yeah. And the, the, que the question, the question is, is the, there's, there's, let's say hypothetically there's been a deed entered into where a bank agrees to sell one parcel of land, the issue of issuing a default notice is not dealt with in the deed. Mm. And the bank, the question is, is the bank then able to issue a default notice? And generally speaking, we have to look at the deed. Yes. But if the issue of the sale of the land had been dealt with by the deed, there would be, in theory, no issue, yeah. no reason to issue a default because it's already been dealt with. Mm, I would have thought so. But I would have, I would yeah. want to have a look we at We need the to deed. see the deed. And whether it's um, covered off and whether it deals with the matter finally, finally and or fully. whether there is any reason to incorporate back in provisions it's of the National Credit, Credit Code. Code which require you then to operate on the deed and a default on the deed. But that is a really... Yeah. Oh, it's, what, an what, what, it's an excellent what, question to, to start. Yes. Um, and, yeah, so I think have a look at the deed. Yeah, have a look at the deed. See what's in there. But get legal advice. Like client should on that, on advice. that, uh, and this is one of the other things I think that, there is a lot of things that workers can do without having a law degree, but there are some things like that where you really want the input of a lawyer 
as to what the effect of that deed is going to be Agreed. going forward. And and look, and another thing that I would just mention yeah. about that is that banks or lenders will often for um to put it beyond doubt, may issue default notices um, in those circumstances based on an agreement in the deed where they're not really required to at law. So just because something's happened in the past and you think, oh, well, that's really... Just what, how it always happens. Uh, yeah, or how it should happen doesn't necessarily mean exactly. that it is. Absolutely. But the thing about the code of practice, just before we move on, is if they happen to be a member of AFCA, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, mm. why do we like codes of practice? Well, because they can take it into account in their decision making. And that's really important. And fairness yes, as well. well. All right. Let's move to... Well, yeah. We've, we've covered this a little bit already, but I guess the special categories and general goods and services mm. are worth talking about. Except, can I just go back? Because I just want to talk about general goods and services. I have yes. had so many people come to me, and one that's popped up recently is school fees. Yeah, so have I, um, Loretta. So, I, um, and even what's been interesting is people have thought that there should be responsible lending mm -hmm. obligations applied to the purchase of goods and services. Yes. and. Uh, let me tell you, there is no responsible lending obligations. Um, if you want to send your children to a private school, then that is a decision. A decision you're making financially, mm. that, and if the school is entitled to their money. Yeah, they're entitled to their money. It's not regulated lending. Okay. Uh, and, and when you think about it, and I always think about this, I mean, in a sense, there can be lenders that are very micro businesses as yep. well and need to have their money back. But these people are providing services. Um, they're not in the business of lending. They're in the business of providing services. You have an obligation to pay. There are- And the same argument applies for any other basic general room services mm -hmm. you might purchase yeah. and not pay for immediately. Yeah, and so they, they yeah, they raise those things, but I'm in hardship. It's irrelevant. And, and um, there's no hardship requirements on companies who you buy goods and services from. Yeah. Simple so as that. There might be for the special categories. There yeah. might be. So, body court, let's, just because I don't like doing things in order, <laughs> let's do body corporate. Yeah. We see a lot of people in trouble with body corporates mm -hmm. and, and not pay, being able to pay all of the fees. Mm -hmm. And I think that's only going to increase as we come out of COVID. So do you want to just explain, just in case there's people out there that don't know what body corporates are? Is? Very yeah. good question. So um, what body corporates are is, so if you buy a unit in a unit block, or I personally live in a townhouse estate, as mm. part of that estate, there's a committee which manages the common areas, like say the, the lawns, the yards, the gardens, makes sure if you've got a pool, it keeps them up to date, keeps them in a good condition. And in return for them doing that, you pay the body corporate a quarterly fee, mm. which they put towards those sort of services and keeping things like the roofs updated yeah. and sometimes they might paint the doors front we had our garage door painted, those sort of basic services. So if one person doesn't pay, who has to pay? Like, who had, who's responsible for those costs? If so, it's, if it's not recovered, it's yeah. everybody else is in the complex. And I think that's often what people don't understand is that it's your neighbours that pay. Yeah. It's not some third party um, that comes in and some corporate entity. Mm -hmm. It's your neighbours that pay. And I think that sort of puts it into a different perspective yeah. as to why uh, it's, you know, people want to recover that money because it's in impost on the yes. other owners. But a lot of body corporates, even though they're not required, will consider hardship requests. Yes. And, and often grant them. But if you're looking at, uh, but again, this is one where it's really state-based. Okay. Absolutely. So what happens in different states, so in Queensland, there's not really anything in the legislation. 
but um, like Paul said, the individual body call might. You lose happen. nothing by asking. However, it brings me back to this thing that we've often raised in other webinars as well, that you really do when you're in trouble with debt, need to think about what debts you're going to prioritise. Yep. Body corporate fees is a debt that I would be prioritising because if you don't get um, if you don't get it sorted, it can be the one that actually means that you lose your property. And most people prioritise their mortgage, and which is good in some sense. Um, but we probably see people, more people, losing their houses because of unpaid body corporate in recent history. That would be true, and they're quite aggressive, so you don't have much of a chance. Now we've had a question about the fading of the. The handouts, um, the handouts. We can't help you, unfortunately. Uh, but when we when we send out information about the webinar going up, mm -hmm. we will provide an updated handouts that don't have those faded pages. Yes, that's that's so all our, we can promise you. So our our apologies about that. Um. So the other thing that was on there is council rates. Yep. Really inconsistent. The mm. approach of councils in Queensland, I find. Yes. So again, there's no legislation, but most councils have something. I think most councils have something that you should ask about. Yeah, and go and get a copy of. So, um, and they might, sometimes I, I suggest to people if they're really struggling, this is one that you might want to get a bit of legal advice about because it might be what are the different policies. It might also be dependent on the way the council deals with you. It might be something that you can make. We're remembering also that we won't cover this year, mm. but late last year, the process that councils follow around rates and how they can sell actually was updated and changed mm. in the legislation. But I think it, it, I think it actually um, aids councils yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I mean. It aids councils more, and it's important everybody. Is exactly. Aware of yeah. So um, here at first I thought, oh yes, some changes that will be good for consumers. <laughs> but sadly not. <laughs> I was too optimistic. You were indeed. <laughs> um, and finally, and I'll park insurance for a minute. Utility providers, I think, are getting better at their hardship processes. Yes. Yeah. They're sure. not by no means perfect, but mm -hmm. I think they're improving. And I, I think it's important, as always, like we say with banks or let any lender, if your client's in trouble, the earlier they approach the utility provider, more often, the more that utility mm. provider can do. And the utilities um, are both state-based and commonwealth. So with telecommunications, it's, well, it's a national code of practice, okay. yep. and um, it's a quite a good code of practice. And if you then aren't satisfied, you can go to the telecommunications industry ombudsman, with utilities, um, energy and water, there are energy and water ombudsmen all over, over various in, states. in various states. And again, um, I would look to your various states to see what's required in terms of hardship. And those Queensland Financial Councils online who were lucky enough to have been at the Financial Counselling Conference last week would have heard from Jane Perez, who's the Ombudsman at our Energy and Water Ombudsman Queensland. Mm. Um, so, so, and we've just, there is a hardship policy for water, I, I agree, um, for water mm. companies, but what we're saying about councils is for the rates payments. Yes, so when we talked about utilities, that's when we were talking, talking about, about energy water. and water. So just but like, thanks, Rose. That's a, always always happy to receive those sort of questions and feedback. All right. So just moving quickly on to COVID, and we, we the initial stuff we'll cover very quickly because we mm. want we want to talk about what's going to happen now. Yes. Don't we? And we we mentioned earlier the idea that banks, on the whole, have responded very well and have provided both initial deferrals for people who were struggling, uh, and now provided extensions uh, to people who, with a bit more time, are likely to be back on their feet. Mm. And the figures coming out of APRA and 
the Australian Bank Association suggest, I think the last figures I saw were over 90% of people who were on deferrals are now back making payments. Which is great. Which is really positive. But that leaves a lot of loans so, going to financial councils and community organisations. But um, I'll be honest, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Mm. Well, I wonder what it's going to be like when job key pains. Well, that's the question, isn't it? So yeah. let's talk about that. Well, what will happen? So, well, at the moment, what is the bank's, and, and remember this is a bank response, but it's likely to be across the industry. In, industry try, in, on the whole, industry has tried to do whatever it can. Yeah. But they are recognising, and I think mm. it's fair for us to recognise, help might not be able to continue forever. Mm. So, Banks and lenders, it, let's say, JobKeeper, I think, ended last night, I think, 28th no, of March, or is it I 31st? Thought, I thought it was the 31st. Either it ends, it, it ends, <laughs> it ends once we've hit April. Exactly. <laughs> I think so. Jeez, we should have really checked that really well. <laughs> I, I did, and it's left my head. That's how long ago this morning. But the important bit about it is those JobKeeper payments are no longer there. So mm -hmm. businesses who have been relying on that um, payment to survive as a business are no longer getting those payments. So they're going to have to make decisions of, is my business viable? Mm. Aren't they? Yes, for sure. And if they decide my business is not viable, all of those people who are on JobKeeper from that business are losing their jobs. Yeah, exactly. And there's there's a particular slide that we're going to talk about, particularly JobKeeper and what that means for people who are losing their jobs. Employment because wise. there will be there will be people who legitimately lose their jobs because of those, but there might also be other reasons, and that's why we really want people to get advice. Right. But if you end up at the end of so, if we weren't talking about the end of JobKeeper or job or the reduction in job seeker. So some of those 90% that might have restarted paying their loans, some of that might be because they've had income from job keeper or, or an increased job seeker, which they may now all lose as a result of um, the And they mean they're back in hardship. Exactly. So the there's three different types of people I think that were um, that are now facing what they need to face. So there's a there's a group of people that have gone back to paying their loans in full, and we'll talk about what the impact of JobKeeper, where well, they may end up falling into hardship again. Yeah. There's some that can, and I'm not entirely sure what this means by paying in full. Are the banks saying, and I, I genuinely don't know, so, um, are the banks saying that when they say make payments in full, are they talking about ongoing payments or do they want people to start paying back extra for the time that they were had their loan deferred? Well, this is the interesting bit, Loretta, because we've had some complaints about lenders saying you have to pay back all of the arrears from COVID in three or six months, mm. which to me is entirely unreasonable. Uh, absolutely, and it's not what people went it's in thinking, thinking was going to happen. I, I wonder what they did think of, was going to happen. I suspect they thought that they wouldn't have to make payments, and then once once the deferral period ended, they just keep making their normal payments, and it would the be loan capital, would be extended, capitalized at the end. And that's my understanding. What a lot of people thought as well. And, but I don't know if the, like you said, a lot of lenders are actually saying. I wouldn't say a lot. Well, some. some. We've had some complaints. So mm -hmm. if, if you're out there and you've got clients with those complaints, that's something I would push back on because I know it's something that it wasn't intended to happen as part of the moratorium that you then have to pay the arrears back in an unreasonable time. But having said that, I think this is one of the issues for credit reporting as well because credit reporting and this is about what is an impaired loan yeah. and what is a loan that's not impaired, impaired. Yeah. and it's got nothing to do with the contractual relationship between the lender between say Paul and I 
um, it's got more to do with how APRA, which is the Australian Credential, Credential Regulatory, Regulatory Authority, Authority. Yep. Um, looks at loans that banks in particular are given. And if they're in paired loan, they have to treat them differently. So, so what I think will happen is we may have lenders starting to say, um, you need to um, not only repay the, uh, make your ongoing payments, but make extra repayments so you can catch up on the deferrals. Or, or I, I still think where, where you're making your payments and it's an option for you, capitalisation for a lot of people is a legitimate option. And that may require the loan to be um, formally varied and uh, That's really, and start about that. And this is the issue is that um, there is some argument or some discussion in the community as to if you want the loan formally varied, does the bank then have to do another responsible oh, lending yeah. assessment? Yeah. Now, I don't think it should because it's something that you are entitled to ask for under the National Credit Code. But it is something that um, lenders are pushing for. Oh, well, lenders say needs to happen if they want you to have a formal variation of the contract. So oh, that that's something that's worth getting legal advice about yes. if you're being pushed on. And or yes, or if they're saying we can't give you the formal, we can't give you the variation because you won't meet our response, uh, you know, our lending assessment. However, Lorena, if you can't meet the payments going forward, mm -hmm. then we're back to the discussion we had earlier around the hardship there is asking for time to sell potentially. Yes, potentially. And this is what, this is the third group of people who can't, still can't pay. Okay. They're really going to be asked to go through the assessment process to see if there's anything else. And this is when you should really be talking to your clients about whether it's a good idea to sell or not. We've had a question, but it's not a question that we... Look, the question's around tenancy, not something either of us have any expertise in. Mm. Um, and in Queensland, um, I would refer you to uh, Tenants Queensland with a QSTARS phone number, which mm. off the top of my head I don't have. Uh, but if you search QSTARS online, that will provide the appropriate tenancy referral. Okay. All right. So I'll just move to the next slide. Technology. And we're probably talking longer than I thought on each side. We are talking significantly longer, but that's all right. Give us, give us the two-minute version of credit reporting for that. So that well, it's very difficult to do this in twenty minutes. <laughs> I'll try. Have a go. Um, before I start, I just want to say one of the things that happened during COVID with banks giving these deferrals is that they may have inadvertently implied. Not so much for now, but that if there's any of these programs in the future, that your credit report or your repayment history information won't be affected the by the law change the loan deferrals. So you have to realise going forward, yep. and especially from July next year. So that's July 2022. All financial hardship arrangements will be reported on your um, credit report. Credit report. Um, so what happened, and I think we talked a little bit about this on one of the other webinars, is that when COVID came into place, there was two ways that people were reporting if somebody was in a financial hardship arrangement. They were simply not reporting at all. Or they were reporting as saying against the arrangement, which meant that as soon as you went into the arrangement, you, you had a zero. Yeah, yeah, you had a zero. And because you were meeting your obligations under the arrangement. The other thing that the law is going to change is for banks, it will make it mandatory that they report. So they can no longer go, we're not reporting anything. So during COVID, it basically followed that route. Um, there might have been lenders that if there was a financial hardship arrangement simply wouldn't report and that remained the same or they would have reported it as a zero um, 
but under the new law, any financial hardship arrangement will need to be reported. And the other thing that's going to happen is that thing that we were talking about just before, um, where we said what would be the end of hardship or what would be an arrangement going forward, there is um, the discussion is, well, what does it mean if you've got a three month moratorium? Are you back on track when you start making full payments or does your financial hardship arrangement extend until you've caught up with the uh, arrears what you will be behind. or you've had a formal variation? And that is a source, would will be a source of much um, angst on the part of our consumers. And a question's come through, which is what I was just about to raise with you, Loretta. My concern about all this new law is we're going to struggle to get any of our clients to ask for hardship, aren't we? Abs well, this is a bit of our concern. Well, this is our concern um, going forward Good. is that Will they seek hardship arrangements? Because our clients are obsessed with credit reports. They are. It's, it, you know, you, you would think that there were a lot of other things going on in their life, but people find, and they don't really care, people are not that protective of their privacy. But in terms of credit reporting, they really do care. Protected above all oh, else, sometimes irrationally so. So we're, we're concerned about that, that they might not ask for hardship early. The second thing is that we're very concerned about is that um, that consumers may seek unregulated credit yep. to actually buffer, to give this impression that, that they're, they're doing okay. Yep. Uh -huh. um, and I think that, it, and one of the other thing is having hardship information for future credit I'm not sure whether it will affect a person's ability to get finance yes. or get finance at a cheap rate. So there will my, be. My big worry is it will lead to even more differential pricing than we're already seeing. That's what. That's basically it. That we will end up one either that you can't get the lending or two um, that you um, if, have if, differential. If, if your credit rating is good, you might get. 3% interest rate, whereas if mine's bad, I might have to pay 10 for the, yeah. percent for the same one. Absolutely. So there you have it. That's my short answer on yeah. credit reporting. And I guess we would flag, be on alert in the next 12 months because the detail of what's coming in will become more and more available the closer we get to July 2022. And there will, yeah, and there will be some opportunity to because the practical the practical application of that law needs to be included in the code okay. practice. Yep. So uh, in the credit reporting code. So I suspect that there will be some opportunity for um, consumer, uh, you know, for yep. workers in the field to make representations about that. And another question that's come through is around formal variations and whether we said they needed to be subjected to responsible lending, Loretta. Uh, well, that has been some of the criticisms in the past yes. that lenders don't want to do formal variations to contracts because they think that they do have to apply and we uh, a responsible think lending that's true. assessment. With, yeah, exactly. So, but I think clients will ask for it more oh. if they think it's going to have an impact on their credit report. Yeah. Um, and I also think that lenders, when they give moratoriums, will need to say to people that this is not a formal variation of your contract right. and your credit report will be affected. Okay. And thank you for the comment that's come through that they've recently found out from ANZ that ANZ will not be doing that responsible lending on the formal variations. Oh, good. So thank you for that comment. Just quickly on bankruptcy, this slide probably speaks for itself in terms of the figures. Yes. So, um, well, except we want to talk about the threshold. I thought we might talk about the threshold because this is when a creditor wants to bankrupt yep. consumers. And it used to be 5,000, then it went to 20,000 during COVID. And that's going to be 10. That's going to be 10. But what does that mean? It means you need 10 grand worth of debt 
if you're a predator before you can formally take bankruptcy. But do you need it to be just one loan? No, no. So if a creditor only has a debt for $5,000 and they get somebody else's debt, that's also for $5,000. And they buy it. They then, will be And that's enough. That's enough. So just as long as you're aware of that, um, if you are advising clients. You no know, limit, should... there's no amount of, in terms of there's no bottom limit on when a debtor can make themselves bankrupt. But there's always a serious question to be had about whether it's worthwhile for very small amounts and whether there are other options available. And there are, and there is a push at the moment to, again, have bankruptcies be just for a period of 12 months. And for some of our clients, that would be very useful. So we'll just have to keep an eye out there on that one, Loretta, yeah. and see what develops, won't we? I think we've probably talked a lot about this eroding equity already. I think that's a big one around making a decision around clients selling a house or not selling a house. So I just wanted to, yeah, I agree, but I just wanted to talk about that, um, the reason the banks gave for not, um, for charging interest yeah. and not. Go for it. And that's really um, because Australian banks are required to hold a certain amount of their lending on capital reserve. Capital reserve. And that means they can't lend that money out. Yeah. If loan, if they're not charging interest on loans, that is treated differently in terms of a risk Absolutely. and that requires them to hold more capital. So if um, they have these loans that they haven't charged interest on, they have to hold more capital and that means they can't lend it out to yeah. other people, which means that the credit market is squeezed and that could then increase interest rates and will not make lending as available. Well, that's been the, the that's argument. Right. And I think that there is some- There's something in that argument. Yes. So, um, yeah. Now, look, with, again, what options can we do? Let's say somebody wants to take one of our clients to court. Let, it's, this slide's really just a reminder around what other options might help the client if mm. they're in a position to keep the house or keep themselves above water, head above water financially? Um, exactly. So these are the sort of things that, um, this is stopping enforcement before, before judgment. judgment. And what, I, what we mean by stopping enforcement before judgment is anything up until the court decides that um, the, uh, that the money is owed? The money is owed or that they're going to give possession of the property. property. And, and it's a formal judgment is issued by a court. court. Now in each jurisdiction, jurisdiction that will be a different, different process. Absolutely. And it's where you can do the most in terms of going to the Australian Financial Complaints Authority for, hard, for arguing about whether you should get hardship and to talk about whether you're liable for the, the debt at all. Because AFCA's jurisdiction becomes more and more limited the further along we get. The, the further along the enforcement path right. that you get. So default notices, okay. Once they make a claim, starting to get more and more difficult, difficult. post-judgment, very difficult. If any, and just our usual reminder, if any of your clients ever get a statement of claim, they must get legal advice. Exactly. Um, so, and the other thing, there are some grants in Queensland in particular that can be useful in stopping um, judgment. Yeah. Uh, well, well in, in catching your mortgage up. So yeah. that judge, there's no reason for judgment to be issued or um, accessing it even sometimes so after afterwards. judgment. Yeah. But that's for particular um, debts. Um, the only other thing I'd say about this slide is be very careful around the access in super. That's something I would only consider as a last resort if it's going to solve the problem. If it's, uh, if it's going to see the client behind again in six months time on their mortgage, then it's a terrible idea. Exactly, because really, again, what all you're doing is eroding equity in the property. property. And you're eroding equity. I always say to people, 
there's a difference. If you had to make, if you had to pay six hundred dollars a week in rent, yeah. then if the mortgage and what you lose, what you're losing is less than six hundred dollars a week that you're paying in rent, might be a good idea to stay for an extra six months. But if it's costing you eight hundred dollars a week by the time you pay your rates, your insurances mm -hmm. on the house, your repayments, the interest on that, then it's not a good thing use to stay in the property. It's terrible use of that money financially. And you're going to lose more. Yeah. So, but that's sometimes quite difficult for people to understand. I agree. Um, and again, we covered this after judgment. You can buy negotiation arrange payments, but very rarely happens, I find. Yes. Um, unless unless they haven't, unless it's default. Yeah. And there's real clear issues about it, it depends very much on the lender. I think it's I and, and and the individual circumstances of the client. So you know, if you've got somebody that's extremely elderly, like I once had when they were, you know, well over 80, and what you're asking, and you're essentially last asking for a life tenancy in that sense. Exactly. And the lenders may very well be open to that, yep. given the they don't want that, they don't want that publicity. No. And if they're confronted with that, can I just, um, I just want to go back because. The one thing that people often say to me, well, I didn't get a copy of the claim. And this is state-based, so I just want to be really clear about that. So when you when there is a judgment, a default judgment, our consumers come to us maybe a year or two later and say, I'm and they're just about to be thrown evicted from the property, they often come to us and say, I didn't get a copy of the claim. And I always say to them, well, there's two things about that. It's not enough to simply say that it's... You can't it's just very, say I didn't get it. I, well, even if you could show that you didn't get it, that will not be enough for you to set aside the judgment mm -hmm. because you need something else. And that is you need to be able to demonstrate that you have a defence. And a defence can be within hardship but you would have to be able to demonstrate that you were in hardship and that you can meet your obligations absolutely that whole process is extraordinarily expensive to set that aside and often even if they can show that even if the if lender can show yeah. that the person got service then you would be liable for the lender's costs in that process yes, and it can be ten thousand dollars easily you know it can be an extraordinary amount of money so just sometimes when uh, even workers approach us and go well this is totally unfair and they go why can't you just set it aside one it's an enormous amount of work to go and do that and the clients may still be liable for, for money that they can't afford in the first place exactly the other, so this slide just quickly, Loretta, which we won't talk about, but I'll draw everybody's attention to. AFCA, and I know there's somebody from AFCA on the line, has some great resources around these issues, including financial difficulty, mortgagee sales, and joint facilities and family violence that I would recommend if you're interested, having a read of, because they set out how AFCA, if a complaint about these issues is, makes it all the way to them, how they would look at the issues and that can be mm. really informative even just for educating your clients about what's going to be a reasonable approach mm, that's right now now this is the one i wanted to get to okay so when job keeper ends we suspect that there's going to be a lot of redundancies yeah and the, there will be a question as to whether the redundancy is genuine or not genuine. So when you were talking, Paul, about the businesses that decide that they can no longer operate, they have to close down and let everyone They're going to be genuine most of the time. Okay. There's also going to be issues, like we said, about demotions, loss of working hours, pay reductions. The most important thing that we think that you should do in those situations if you lose your job 
or the conditions of work change, you must seek legal advice immediately. Unless you know the business really has gone out of business and you don't suspect that there's anything because there's really strict time limits that will apply. Because it might very well be, there's a number of matters, but particularly for unfair dismissals, there's a very short time, time frame. And then I guess the other thing around job seeker being reduced. Mm. Uh, yes. So job seeker may also be reduced and there might be greater activity tests, which might then see you get cancellations again, Centrelink cancellations. And the other thing we saw during COVID or we heard about during COVID was people coming off the DSP yes. to get the higher amount. All right, well, I'm going to talk You're to you about that in a few minutes. But I just wanted to say this we, is we a very, too, all right, very basic slide. But what I wanted to stress about this is that we are going to do some further employment um, webinars that really go and look into job in, in Excellent. So with the DSP, we've now heard that there hasn't been that many people that came off the DSP. The problem is that if you want to go back onto the DSP, you have to start again. You have to do your medical review, you have to get your reports, you have to show that you, um, you know, that you can, that there's no further treatment available. You have to be able to meet the points on the points table. These are all things that uh, it may mean that whilst you might have got on the DSP 10 years ago, you may no longer qualify for the DSP. So again, you want to get advice about it. All right, now, before we do the takeaways, I, there, that's what I was looking for. We've had some questions come through already um, uh, that we need to have a look at. Um, the first one around, we can't comment on financial council funding. Um, we do agree though, we tend to see that we see a delay between the problem arising mm -hmm. and people seeking help. That's fairly normal, yeah. even prior to COVID. Um, I think potentially this is an issue we are dealing with over the next potentially two to three years. I, I absolutely agree. And in fact, we've had a quiet time, so we expect that things will really ramp up, particularly because people got all that money mm -hmm. from um, you know, release of super, um, um, which job, jobs, job keeper, and, yeah, and job seeker okay. increases. So it really did take the pressure yeah, off people, but I think it's coming, yeah. no question. Quarantine gets the rubber. Um, we see well, a lot about that in the media, don't we? We haven't had any that we've dealt with, but our understanding is it's really individual state governments yeah. that provided those services. And it's really that you need to look to the state governments as to um, what they are going to do in relation to those debts. The thing is, in Queensland, if it's a debt to the state, they may not have a statute of limitations so attached the, to the it. So the usual six years you, a lot of you are used to hearing us talk about mm. may not apply. So if you want to, it, it, it's probably... Whether it's going to be default listed or not will depend on who it's to, whether they qualify as a, um, whether they meet the definition of a credit provider yeah, for the purposes of that legislation. And if you want to list, you have to be a member of a um, ombudsman. And I don't know if, uh, I, I think that there's an issue with state governments anyway, listing debts. I suspect it's similar to um, federal government yeah. agencies. Yeah but I'm not entirely sure. I think you go to your individual um, state and, government and, and departments. And you get legal advice if there's things being threatened. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Small business owners, Loretta, I, we, <coughs> we aren't really in a position to talk about the law on that, are we? There, absolutely, but let me just say this. There are, um, I was speaking last, I went to a conference last week, some of the liquidators out there, are willing to give um, free first consultations to small business owners um, so that they can talk to them about what they might need to do if they can't afford to liquidate in those circumstances. So I would look to being a bit more creative as to who you could go to to get assistance with. Them. I would agree with that. Mm. 
Um, so the one final question that we have time to deal with that's come through is around a DSP and somebody suffering from multiple issues but not individually getting enough points. Our advice there is seek legal advice. From seek legal advice from either Basic Rights right. Queensland or right. Legal Aid Queensland if you're in Queensland. If you're in the other states. There are similar organisations who will be able to give you that advice as well. That's right. And oh well, that looks like it's it. We are right on time, guys. If there's any, maybe one final question that you have that you want to send through, please send that through quickly um, and we can maybe respond to you at a later date. Yeah. Um, can I thank you all for your involvement and for tuning in this morning? Um, those, an updated version of those slides and, and the recording will be issued as soon as we can. Um, and we'll, we will email that out to you and give you the link to the recording on the website. Um, if you've got any other questions in the meantime, please feel free to shoot questions through to the email that you signed up to um, and we can deal with those if part prior or part, not prior, after was the word I was looking for. <laughs> after the webinar, other questions pop into your head, we're happy to ask them. And we may not get to you given that we're going in the three day lockdown. <laughs> we will get to it as soon as we possibly can. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your involvement. Thank you to Loretta. It's always a pleasure to present. Thank you. Same here. All right. Thank you, everyone. And I will end the webinar now.